When you're told that you're going to have the opportunity to write a piece to be recorded by a world-class, multiple Grammy award-winning new music ensemble, your heart just sort of drops. You often hear the phrase, in control of your own destiny, but that's especially true for me. If I do really, really well on this piece, it's more or less my ticket to grad school. And if I don't, there's no telling if there's even going to be a next opportunity. So throughout the composition of this piece, I'm going to be taking you blow by blow through each step of the compositional process, from the first draft to the finished product. Terrifying. I'm the classical nerd, and I'm writing a piece for 8th Blackbird. The only functional limitation here is that of time. Due to the nature of the recording session, the piece's maximum duration is going to be about 7 minutes. From a performance standpoint, the Blackbird is comprised of some of the most phenomenal musicians in the whole world, and they work together as one cohesive group, which is really something special. This means I can write things I just can't write for student performers, which is what, as a student, I usually have. Not a knock on student performers, regardless of where they come from, because some of them are absolutely top-notch. They just don't have the capabilities that a group of literal world-class touring professionals have. Um, it's been on a number of occasions that I've written what I wanted to hear in a particular piece, and it ends up not being performable, or you know, various things happen and it precludes performance. It leads me to have this sort of disparate body of work, which I either have pieces that are tougher and and so you know don't get performed or don't get performed nearly as much as I would want, or they're a bit easier and I end up having to sacrifice something. But when when you're thrown into the position where you can have literally anything on the table with you know within reason within the within the limits of the instrumentation and within the limits of time if you can create anything you know what what do you create so you, you have to sort of impose on yourself some kind of limitation in order to actually start the piece so the compositional process i've decided on is an arch structure so over the course of the piece the beginning is going to have a counterpart at the end and you know, vice versa um it's important to me, that each counterpart be different and not just sort of a flat repetition. Uh, the derivation should be subliminal, so the piece is still going to work, but it's it should be harder for the for the listener to actually grasp precisely why. So what I'm doing here is actually writing the piece backwards as much as I am forwards. So I want there to be a link between sections on these sort of opposing poles. For instance, I have this initial motive: major third fall, minor third rise. This comes back at the very end. Different rhythmic profile and different orchestration, but it's still there. This cello glissando is mirrored in this violin glissando, and the sound of the wind machine is mirrored on each side as well. I, I'm not going to work the entire piece this way, it, because it's very abstract, and it's hard, at least for me, to work in this way. Um, at the very least, it frames each side, and there will be some sense of symmetry, some sense of opening and some sense of closing. Uh, and that's really, I think, uh, what I want out of, you know, at least sort of the context of the rest of the piece. Even if this ends up being just the intro and the outro, uh, and the main pieces in the middle. Yeah, so within these sections that mirror one another, there's there's some kind of link. It's either timbre, melodic gesture, you know, what have you. Roughly speaking, they're equidistant from their uh, respective ends of the piece. Um, but I, I don't really want to have the piece heard in retrograde. Because what makes sense forward doesn't make sense backward, especially rhythmically. Now, pitches you can get away with a little bit more. Uh, I would argue maybe not as much as some composers think they can. <laughs> but um, but definitely in, in terms of in terms of rhythm, that's, that's one of the main things that I'm really trying to push myself with this piece. My music does tend to be intensely rhythmic, or at least sort of rhythmically oriented. So I'm taking a conscious decision to step back from that. I tried that first in a, a little bit in a, in a wind ensemble piece I wrote over last summer called Albad for the Midnight Sun, but that was not nearly to the same extent as this. I just used I just used sort of a non-metrical technique in, in certain sections. A lot of things occur on downbeats. You know, within the context of the meter, you can have you can have lyrical lines that actually manage to do that. Um, but I want what I wanted to do was offset things and make sure that the things that actually landed on beats or the things that actually landed on downbeats made sense. Uh, I wanted them to be, you know, important notes within the context of the line. And uh, if you do that well, I think it really sounds interesting, and it gives a nice sort of ethereal 
floating quality to it. Uh, and combined with, you know, pushing myself to create longer and longer and longer lines, um, which is one of my goals in this piece. I really haven't done that quite so much yet. Um, I think it's going to be an interesting sound. You know, whether or not I like it, whether or not, I, you know, that becomes part of my compositional language, I don't know. Um, so what, what exactly do I mean by, by this? So visually, if we take a look at the Albad, you can see that the notes are occurring sort of on every quarter if you just mark the quarters. Um, except for the opening, which has this sort of out-of-time trumpet line. Um, actually has some of this... Some of the same third motion you see in this this little piece, but even if you're not trying to stick to rhythm, rhythmic profile of individual lines is very important, and I would argue that this is even more important when you're writing something that's not particularly metrically oriented, which is really oxymoronic. But if you don't have an underlying metric structure that you can hear that the music sort of snaps to, if the music is not snapping to a grid of meter, then you have to have lines that provide their own sense of meter, which well, maybe meter's not the right word, but rather their sort of their sense of rhythm. So you you can design lines to to increase in energy or decrease in energy, uh, which would you know, in sort of common practice music, would be determined by where it comes within a bar and where that bar comes within a phrase. Uh, but you can do this just with the, with the notes themselves, and then you can place them pretty much anywhere, and they work. You know, doubly so if they actually follow through with being a part of the underlying metric scheme. So if it does snap to this grid, and it is like this, it's it's doubly uh, energetic. Uh, let's take this rising line in the violin. It was designed rhythmically to drive forward. Uh, so if you ran this backwards, it would sound completely inane. It works forwards just because it, uh, you can say it embellishes the logical progression of time. So going backwards pushes against the logical progression, and so anything that drives forward becomes just completely incoherent if, if it was run backwards. Uh, if the music is more static or exhibits a more strict adherence to sort of a given rhythmic profile, uh, you can really easily run that backwards. And it's not going to sound the same, but it's going to be more logical and it's going to be a little more coherent. It, it, it's it's very strange, but you, you know I, I don't I'm not a huge fan of, of retrograde for this reason because I feel like it's very limiting. Because if you want the retrograde to sound good. You, you're incredibly hampered with what you can do with the original. Viewers of the channel might remember a presentation that I gave a few weeks ago on musical narrative and my techniques for crafting these kinds of narratives. And I'm intentionally avoiding that in this piece as well, just because I really want to use this opportunity to push myself away from what I don't think are necessarily bad things in composition, but things that I've used, maybe not consistently, but enough so I feel like I need to try to get away from that if I can. I think there's a time and a place, but I don't feel like I'm very comfortable with large-scale composition that's more abstract or writing melodies that that float, kind of like these do, and are, are so offset from particulars of beat. And And the form is also not particularly conducive towards that. I mean, there's not really... I'm trying to think if there's any uh, any stories that from popular culture or sort of popularly known mythologies that end like they began. And, you know, all I can think of is, is, the, is the theory of the big crunch where, you know, cosmologists... There's different, there's different debates in, in this particular branch of cosmology, um, but there are some cosmologists who believe that the universe, uh, which has been expanding pretty steadily, is going to slow down, stop, and then crunch. <laughs> it's going to come back. It's, everything's going to come back together in this uh, second Big Bang. And uh, it's also theorized that 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 actually might make time run backwards, which seems a little odd to me, but uh, I don't know enough about cosmology to dispute it. What were we talking about again? Okay, yeah. So so form, form and title. Uh, I'm going to get to the title in a second, because that's really also another interesting question. I also sort of don't believe that student composers should box themselves into doing just one thing. I think that really does, it does a disservice to yourself more than anything else, not not just whatever institution you happen to be in. I think it's a disservice to you as a composer if you don't try to push yourself, because there's no other context where you can really push yourself and, and do a lot of stuff that you wouldn't not, you wouldn't otherwise do, like 
I mean, I'm not likely going to write film scores professionally, but I've done several, and I've really enjoyed my time doing them because, I mean, otherwise there'd be no room for the experience, you know, and I'm grateful to be at an institution that actually has a film school where I can actually work on these, and, and there's... um. And, and there's really a lot of reward in doing so, even though I don't really feel like that's a particular calling of mine. Part of me wants to stick to what I know how to do well, but, you know, I'd be really remiss, and I'd really, I think, I'd wonder what if, if I didn't if I didn't push myself. You know, I can always fall back on the things that I know I can do well, but this is a real step in a, in a new direction for me. All right, so title-wise, a lot of composers are going to wait until the piece is over, and then they title it, or they struggle with the title. But I've rarely, if ever, been one to work that way. You know, really since I started composing in earnest, so really around 2014, 2015, um, my earliest compositions, I was always really sort of struggling with titles. And then one day it just clicked and I, you know, I have something like 230 different titles for pieces. And I like using these because, you know, I really like text. I, I like to use text as a fundamental compositional building block. And <clears throat> absent a poem, you know, it, it's really important for me to be able to derive emotional content from the imagery of a title. So, you know, if a title is, you know, more upbeat, more exuberant, I'm, I'm going to start reflecting that, and that's going to give me a point of departure. You know, I need something just to get me going, then I can go from there. I perused my large list of titles for pieces, um, and I found one that fits some of the ideas that I had for the timbres of the ensemble that I'm writing for. Uh, I end up selecting one you know, this is again. This is before any note was actually put on the page, and and it was it was more Lejack in tone. It was something like "Memories of Old Souls," um, but you know, I don't I didn't really like that because when I started writing it, it, it needed a title that evoked the eerie and the inchoate. So I selected "Ghosts in the Light." I'm still not super happy with it, um, especially when it comes to what I might do with the middle section. Uh, which is still a complete question mark for me. I mean, I have a couple of ideas. If I change that into something that's really a lot, a lot different, it's going to be different, the middle section, but if it, if, if it ends up being a lot more different, I have a couple of other titles that I think I might go with, and I'm going to get to that in a second. But for right now, I, you know, Ghosts in the Light, I really, I really quite like that. And I'm not going to really explain what it means, because I don't like explaining it insofar as, you know, I don't want people to go into a piece expecting something and then not get it. You know, if a piece of mine is not narrative or in any sense programmatic, I'm not going to be inclined to elucidate the title. What I would say is that I wanted it to work as a lens through which the listener can interpret the piece. So regardless of the status of their belief in ghosts, I mean, I don't believe in ghosts in the traditional sense of, like, disembodied wandering souls or anything. So I, I tend to think that ghosts are more about our own kind of personal baggage, you know, personal ghosts, as opposed to actual, like, metaphysical, you know, supernatural ghosts. And, uh, okay, I'm going to get off on a bit of a tangent here, and I apologize. Ghosts, mythologically speaking, are very strange things. They don't inhabit the realm of light, and bringing them into the light is it's oxymoronic. I mean, you just, it's not something that you see. You can't force a ghost into doing something. And so if you're trying to drag, you're, you're basically dragging it out of one realm and into another where it, it doesn't exist. You can't you can't put it into a realm where you can examine it because that's just the antithesis of what a ghost is. And again, this can be thought of purely in terms of someone wanting to come to terms with a deep, dark part of themselves. And culturally speaking, ghosts inhabit that space. I mean, just think of Hamlet and how scholars have debated whether or not he was mad. He sees the ghost of his father. He toes the line of total insanity and really a descent into into chaos. Shakespeare never tells us if he does. I mean, it's left up to it's left up to scholars and to really actors more than anything else to interpret and perform. I mean, do they think Hamlet's crazy or do they think Hamlet is just acting crazy? And that really informs performances. They're both logical readings, and you can both you can get something out of both. They're still valid interpretations, and that's sort of what I want to go with here. You know, you, you believe in ghosts, it means one thing. If you don't believe in ghosts, it means another thing, but it still makes sense. It still makes sense as a lens. Uh, in that case, the ghost, the uh, the raison d'etre, if I can mispronounce some French for a second, is most certainly real. I mean, at least insofar as the mythology of the play is concerned. All right, <laughs> this is this has gotten psychoanalytical a little bit, but uh, you know, I wanted to bring it up because I think it's an interesting question to ask. It certainly informs the idea that the piece just needs to sort of fizzle out, not come to a traditional ending. 
Based on where the piece might end up going, I might very well change the title, and I'm thinking if I do that, uh, I like Bonfire of the Vanities, which is really kind of a fun title. Um, it has its own historical and cultural implications, but if I do change it, I'll end up talking about that in the next episode. Also, I have a kind of tone row. You know, <laughs> a nice segue there. Also, there's a tone row. Um, yeah, it's not really a row, and it's used pretty freely throughout the what I have of the piece. And eventually it's going to be used in overarching sections that are going to transcend and thus obscure some of the actual formal design. Because again, I'm all about making the form as uh, subliminal as possible. I'm not using it in any sort of strict serialist fashion, but uh, more or less as a, as a point of reference and a point of departure so that the music never really strays too far or too quickly. Now, there's always going to be a thread, and then, you know, I can choose to cut the thread, as opposed to just running out of thread. You know, that's, that's, the, uh, that's the metaphor I use. How I derive this is actually from the ending itself, since it was the second part written after the beginning. Underneath this violin line, I alternate several microtonal seventh sonorities. And yeah, I always sort of wanted to do a video on microtonal seventh chords, because they're very, very cool from an oral and psychological perspective, but I'll, I'll say that spiel. Suffice to say that I crafted the ending by reorchestrating the beginning, and then, again, I just created a line here on the violin that leads, that leads logically into this ending. Uh, around this, I have these microtonal sonorities, which are offset, so they don't all change at the same time. Again, I'm all about making sure only the really important things happen on the downbeats. They're also orchestrated so that they're interesting lines with different profiles. I mean, there could be three or four notes, but you know they they go down and up and various things. So the cello goes D, C, C half sharp, G half sharp, perfect fifth there at the end. Clarinet has A half sharp in harmonic with B flat and a half, then E half flat and then A half flat, rising line of a tritone and a major fourth. Major fourth? No, fourth, perfect fourth. <laughs> A major fourth is a thing when it comes to uh, quarter tones, but this is not a major fourth. This is just a perfect fourth. Um, so the flute line goes C sharp and a half, B half flat, G half sharp, C half sharp. So skip stepwise and skip motion in different directions. The C half sharp to G half sharp cross the flute and cello is just a voice exchange. I just thought that that sounded interesting there. We're going to take each of them as unique notes for now, but uh, functionally they're they're basically not. So as a side note, this is actually currently in concert pitch. This is a B-flat clarinet. Transpositions, generally speaking, the last thing I do once a piece is concluded. It's just easier on me to think in concert pitch and move things around from there. I can manage uh, doing that, you know, especially in a chamber music setting where you only have to worry about one, maybe two transpositions tops. Um, but uh, especially when you're working in quarter tones, you, you don't want to... <laughs> it's like... What's, you know, down a major second from C half flat? You, you, you don't really want to, to ask those questions. <laughs> it, uh, it, 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 makes your, it makes your brain want to melt and come out your ears. Okay, so to get to the row I mentioned, you just concatenate the notes of the lines. Concatenation being a term borrowed from programming languages to represent disparate strings of characters that are then joined by a, a function. You occasionally see it in linguistics and math, just sort of higher mathematics, but computer programming is the context in which I first heard it. So if we, if we raise all these pitches by a quarter tone, uh, it's easier to read, <laughs> so you have a very... But again, you can see this is a very malleable and a mostly rising line. If you count the flute cello voice exchange as a voice exchange and not new notes for the row, you remove them and you get this nine-note row. Furthermore, the figure at the front end has this embellishing tone motion that really doesn't seem to me to be a real solid part of the structure. It's almost more like an upbeat. Removing those gives you the row in its most minimal format, which is C-sharp, A-sharp, E, G, D, B, G-sharp. And so we never have a row that looks something like this. You can reverse engineer a scale, especially when you have six, seven, eight, even nine notes on occasion. So let's put these in chromatic order, and we're going to transpose the whole thing down a half step and respell the pitches for convenience. So what we're going to get here is C, D flat, E flat, F sharp, G, A, B flat, which is an octatonic scale minus one note. And the note missing means that there is the equivalent of a minor third between two consecutive pitches. In a scale, it's usually an augmented second. We see here this is the E flat to F sharp. This is generally avoided in melodies from the common practice period, primarily because it was 
spelled like a second, but it sounded like a third. It just sounded disjunct and awkward if you were doing scale-like passages. The more of these you have in a scale, the more Eastern European or Middle Eastern it generally sounds. So when I hear this scale, this octatonic minus one note, I think of a kind of Middle Eastern octatonicism. There's something really unusual and really unique about it that I actually really like. Um, it's strange and, and kind of spooky. Since we've broken the octatonic symmetry, we can now actually derive seven different modes. You could do that with the octatonic scale as it stands because it's because it alternates half and whole steps. You know, the modes are equivalent, um, which is what Olivia Messiaen called the modes of limited transposition, which I've not done a full video on, but I, I probably should if there's if there's any interest in that, <laughs> in addition to all the other things that I've promised people. Anyway, so... So this, you know, is very far removed from the piece, you might think, but we're really just zooming in onto one little section and seeing how it works. We can just extrapolate this backwards. So, you know, anytime I do an analysis of my own work and I see sort of why something works, you know, I, if I write something intuitively, I want to know how I did that so, you know, I can do it again if I really want to. And usually, if I write something that sounds interesting or that, that's, that works to my ear, and I can't explain it. Um, it usually has some kind of really kind of logical, theoretical background and, and progression to it, which is exactly what I just did here. What this tells me about this piece in particular is that whenever I use the row, or I guess I should just call it a scale, I'm getting a basic underlying sound that inhabits sort of this kind of tonal realm. And it's especially important to understand how that music is going to inhabit the psychological space in the listener. So, you know, I can choose whether or not I like that, I can choose how and when I use it, if at all, I can choose, you know, uh, different variations on this. Understanding the basic building block, in this case, this scale or the row, however you want to see it. And psychology also changes based on that mode. Like, so where the augmented second lies within this scale uh, is the equivalent of where the tritone lies within the diatonic scale. It's sort of the most unique interval, you know. In the diatonic scale, the tritone is the only fifth on the white keys that's not perfect. And so where it lands in reference to the tonal center of a given mode will make the mode sound like that mode. The fact that, you know, the tritone is between the fourth and the seventh scale degrees in major makes it major. I mean, that's not entirely, but that's that's one of the main things is if it, it has one tritone and where it lies implicates certain things in the psychological realm of the listener. The same thing is true here because this augmented second is a very unique interval within the context of the rest of the scale. Wherever that lies in relation to the tonal center is going to totally change things. I have seven modes to work with within this one unique little scale. So in conclusion, where I'm at right now, right now I'm struggling. <laughs> I'm, I'm struggling. I'm really debating how I'm going to provide a logical and coherent contrast within the middle of the piece, while at the same time preserving this kind of arch structure. You know, I want, um, there's a part of me which really wants to, you know, cut this kind of etherealness off and just go off to the races with something totally different. And there's another part of me that really wants to see how well I can craft that and, and make it so that the excitement and the energy of the middle section uh, forms very, very slowly. It concatenates, if you will, out of the out of disparate elements in the opening and actually comes together to really come to a dramatic high point and then cut off from there. The reason I don't necessarily like that is because it would completely remove the idea of a total arch structure. You know, you wouldn't have sort of an A, B, C, B, A form. In essence, you know, I'm going to be really figuring out how much I feel obligated to the form that I chose, partially because I feel like I need to have a really good reason to break the symmetry. Because if the piece is symmetrical, when you break that symmetry, it has to be for an important moment. And there's a really part of me that, that likes the idea of building up the energy and excitement and dropping that off and then having something more serene. You know, you could have this opening section, you could have a middle section, a B section rather, that ramps things up, and then a C section that's, you know, something even different from both of those in the middle. Maybe some kind of almost concertino-like. Um, texture. Maybe something where the flute goes to alto flute or the clarinet goes to bass clarinet. Really take advantage of all the timbres inherent in the PRO ensemble, then pull that in retrograde and have something that burst of excitement that then comes down and then it ends like it does. I don't know. <laughs> this is, it's a real challenge for me because 
Now, I don't want to start writing something and then realize, oh, this is no good and, you know, have to throw it out. I'm not afraid of doing that, but it's simply that this needs to be done by January, and I know how fast things can go. <laughs> Above all, I think I'm, I'm really obsessed with the ideas of, of form. I'm, I'm very concerned about that, and a lot of my music is in relentless exploration of how woven into the fabric of a given piece I can actually make a form. So I will essentially have achieved my goal if I manage to create a piece of music that's on a large scale and manages to express a coherency of form to the listener without the listener actually being able to pick up on the strands carrying them through. So if I have these big sections where you can really hear the delineation between sections, or at least hear that there's an arch to it, part of me is, is asking the question, well, does that actually sort of contradict what you actually want to hear? I don't know. Uh, and that's something I'm going to have to... I'm going to have to question myself. So, yeah. That's where I'm at right now. Tune in next time and see where I'm at. Probably in the corner crying. <laughs>